Um, show of hands, has anyone here seen the movie Logan? Awesome. So I just saw it last night. Uh, really, really good movie. Darker than I thought it would be. Um, I'm not saying go out and watch it. Uh, there's, there's actually a lot of cussing in that movie. Um, Dr. Xavier cusses kind of a lot in that movie. I'm not spoiling the movie for you. I'm just kind of saying, I'm just like, oh my gosh, like he cusses. It's kind of weird. But the movie is kind of dark and it's kind of violent. And, and uh, I'm kind of asking, you know, the people I watched it with is like, was that movie, is it just me? Like, am I being kind of sensitive about this? Like, no, it's, it's pretty violent. And I think in my younger days, I think that's something that I would have enjoyed more. Not necessarily blood and gore and all that stuff, but, but action-packed movies. And I still enjoy a good action-packed movie, you know, with intricate fighting sequences and, and really planned out car chases and stuff like that. Like, I really enjoy that stuff. And maybe it's a guy thing. I don't know. But there was a time, and I still do, but there was a time when I really enjoyed that stuff. And I would pay good money to go watch that kind of movie. I would go out and buy the DVD or the Blu-ray, right? Like I would pay for it, not click a button and download on my computer. I would go out and pay for it because it's worth my money, I thought. And so I would enjoy that kind of thing. And though, though that kind of movie it is really enjoyable in a theater, right? Because you get the full effect. So you kind of kick back, relax. Nowadays, you literally kind of kick back. I love these reclining seats. Game changer. You literally kick back and you watch, you know, this movie and you're just kind of blown away by, by, by just how intricate and well planned out these special effects are. I mean, cars blown up, right? People just like, fighting scenes are, are just different now, right? They're not just beat you up kind of thing. It's like slow-mo, you know, like really dramatic, crazy fighting scenes. My palate has been changing. I don't know if this means I'm getting old or, or if it's just because I'm just watching a lot of movies. My palate is a little, it's changing a little bit. I like action-packed movies still, but I think now I like a little bit more dialogue. Does that make me weird? I like good acting, as weird as that sounds maybe to you. Pace of the movie, dialogue and scripting, all that stuff is like, that's, I'm, I'd rather pay more money for that you know, than to watch a car blow up. Um, and so the movie watching experience is very different. You know, if you go in to, to watch Logan knowing that because your pastor just told you how violent and how much Dr. Xavier cusses and, and there's blood, you're, you're going to expect it. You're going to kind of sit back and watch and just kind of be blown away by that. But if I were to say, man, it's actually very dramatic and there's, and there's just really powerful dialogue and conversations going on, your interpretation skill, your interpretive method of, of watching that movie is going to be different. You're going to go in expecting to hear a lot of conversation, and so you're going to pay attention to different things. It's not about special effects and cars blowing up and intricate fighting sequences. Now you've got to pay attention to facial expressions. You've got to pay attention to uh, what the body is communicating. You a lot of close-ups of the face and really paying attention to the nuances of the dialogue. You see, that kind of change from watching action-packed movies to more dialogue-driven movies, that kind of change in dynamic is what's happening here in John. Okay, figuratively speaking, we just saw an action-packed book, the Book of Signs, Water into Wine, Healing a Paraplegic, Walking on Water. That's pretty action-packed, right, biblically speaking. You know what I'm saying? And so now we're kind of taking a step back. Now they're literally in a room, and Jesus is talking to his disciples. There's a lot of close-ups, a lot of details that we have to pay attention to, the subtlety of the conversation. Tone is huge, people. And so we have to kind of adjust to the text. If we're waiting about, we're, we're hearing about how Jesus is washing someone's feet and all of a sudden we're waiting for a car to blow up, yeah, I think you're going to be a little disappointed. There's no car that, okay, someone dies on a cross. That's pretty dramatic. But beyond that, subtlety, tone, paying attention to the words and actually thinking about what they're saying. I don't want you to 
be theologically irresponsible here. That's not what I'm saying, but I want you to inject yourself in the text. I want you to, to, to experience and, to, and to, to dialogue with this text, to interact with this text almost as if you are there. And it's almost as if Jesus is speaking to you. It's almost as if you are Peter or you are Thomas. Okay, not Judas. Okay, that's kind of jacked up. But you're one of the disciples and Jesus is washing your feet. And now emotionally, mentally, spiritually, what's going on with you? And now Jesus is about to say something that disciples don't like. And how are you receiving that? What's going on with you? And so it's not to be hermeneutically irresponsible, but it's to really be personal with the text, feel and sense the tone and see the subtlety of the text. And I believe that's really what the Holy Spirit is going to do as he works in us and instills this truth in us. And so go to John 14, and we're going to read just a few verses together. John 14, verse 1. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So here's what's happening in the text. Um, The disciples have spent the last three years with Jesus. And it's not just hanging out with someone for three years, but from the beginning, they they received Jesus' call. So we're, whether they were just kind of hanging out or they're, they're fishing or, or tax collecting, whatever it is, Jesus beckons them. He calls them to discipleship. And so what they now have to do is they now have to leave their jobs, their occupations, their livelihood. They have to leave their families and their communities and their friends. They have to leave all that and really just kind of follow Jesus, and which maybe they don't know at that point, but it's going to be radical discipleship. And so they've left all these things to follow Jesus. And then what happens is they don't just kind of sit back and from a distance and hear Jesus speak. This isn't watching Jesus on YouTube, right? And, and oh, I've experienced Jesus. No, you saw Jesus from a distance. No, but they were there in the miracles. They were there when Jesus turned water into wine. They were there when Jesus walked on water. They were there when he raised, when he's thinking raised a dead man. They were there. And, and, and a lot of times what we see is as soon as Jesus performs this miracle, what John calls a sign, Jesus doesn't say, hey, take a picture. It'll last longer. You know, he, he drops knowledge on them and he challenges them. Do you understand what I have done for you? Do you understand what happened when I just walked on water When Peter stepped down into the water, and for a brief moment in history, he actually walked on water too. Do you understand what I'm doing? When I fed more than 5,000 people and had you collect 12 basketfuls of leftovers, do you understand? So Jesus is challenging them. He's connecting them. He's discipling them. He's beckoning them, and he's calling them. And in that dynamic, church, what happens is you as a disciple, you start to develop an affection for Jesus. It starts to be instilled in you that this is not just a rabbi or a teacher, but there is something about him that that speaks to my soul. There is a sense of authority in him. Who can raise a dead man? Who can walk on water? Who can turn water into wine? A hear paraplegic just by speaking his words. And not only that, Jesus becomes personal with you and he calls you to repentance and he challenges you and he shows you the greater picture of the kingdom, things that other people do not see. You see, what happens, okay, it's imagine you being in small group with the same group for three years except you don't meet once a week for two and a half hours over boba. 
You live with these guys. You see them in their best. You see them in their worst. What happens is there is now a relationship, a deepened, affectionate relationship. And these disciples, when they look at Jesus, he's not just our teacher. He is our Lord. He is our master. He is our friend. And we'll see things like Peter says, I would never deny you. I would follow you to the grave. You see, that is the context here. And then in, we're, we're, uh, we're rewinding just a little bit, but in chapter 13, verse 33, Jesus says, where I am going, you cannot come. Where I am going, you cannot come. And Jesus lays down this new teaching. And then in verses 36 to 38, Peter basically says, listen, Jesus, I don't care what you're teaching. Why can't I follow you? Okay, all joking aside, Jesus, okay, you're, you're saying you're going to leave us. Okay, well, get us on board. How can we follow you? You're, you're leaving us? I mean, you're really leaving us? After all that we've been through? And so, you listen, kind of pay attention to the tone of the text. And if you're familiar with, with the passion narrative, you're familiar with Holy Week, that last week of Jesus' life, and, and, and you're in retrospect looking at this, and you're like, you disciples, you just don't get it, do you? We get it, because we've read this many, many times. But we're looking at the disciples and like, Jesus needs to die. You don't see that? You know, Peter's like, I'm the, you're not going to wash my, I'm going to wash your feet. What, are you serious, Peter? You don't see that? You don't see this whole three, entire three years. Jesus keeps talking about the hour has not yet come. The hour has not come. You're not getting it through your head that Jesus needs to die. All this needs to happen. But in reality, can you blame Peter? Why can't I go with you? Can you blame him? Because cognitive and knowledge aside, emotionally speaking, the way I see this is because it's kind of like defense mechanism. This is their way of, of trying to say goodbye. You see, I connect with that personally because I'm not good at saying goodbyes. With people whom I've become developed an affection and a love for, a respect for, an admiration for, people that have been a real blessing in my life for some reason they need to leave, it's really hard for me to say goodbye. There's one part of me that genuinely wants to say, listen, you've been a blessing in my life. I want to let you know that as a brother, as a, like as a brother in Christ, I love you. And you've, you've been challenging me. You've been an encouragement to me. And you serve me. And, and, I, and I'm deeply going to miss you. You see, there's a side where I want to say that. And there's another side of me, right, that says I'm not going to go down that road. It's sappy. I'm not going to break down. I'm not going to be vulnerable. I'm not going to be transparent in front of this person. And so I'm not going to do it. And then there's another side of me that just says they're not really leaving They'll be back. All that go is what happens in my head and my heart when someone I love leaves. And in, in the end, all I end up doing is saying, okay, bye. Because I don't know how to say goodbye. And so we can speculate, right? It's not action-packed movie anymore. It's dialogue-driven. We're paying attention to the tone. We're paying attention to the subtleties. And we can speculate what's happening here, and we could try to understand how they're feeling. But honestly, we don't have to speculate because this is what Jesus says in chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Doesn't that say everything? listen to what Jesus is saying. He's speaking to the heart, literally. I mean, he says it right there. Let not your hearts be troubled. Church, it's a comforting thing when God in flesh can come to you specifically and tell you, and this is him speaking specifically to Peter. Specifically to Peter. He says, let not your heart be troubled. And I know it's kind of confusing because it says, let not your hearts be troubled. There's a lot of translations that say, let not your heart be be troubled, you in particular. And, and, and I want to be a little bit intricate in how we treat this verse because Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. We see that. And we take that as a what? It's a command. It's an imperative. 
Jesus is commanding you, he's coming to you, and what he's trying to comfort you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Do what you need to do so that you can fix your gaze, you can fix your heart, you can fix your affections on something good so that you have comfort. That's what Jesus is saying. And then he says, believe in God, believe also in me. Now, it's interesting what Jesus says there because in your ESVs, that seems like also an imperative command. Believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus is commanding his disciples, right? He's kind of switching to single-handedly Peter and then now he's looking to his disciples, believe in God and believe also in me. Right? It has that same grammatical tone, but now listen to this, because when Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled, and then he switches to you are believing in God, that's not an imperative, and that's hard for you to see in your English, right? But when you look at the Greek, it's, well, you're not going to look at the Greek. When I look at the Greek, and I'm looking at this, the grammar, the grammar is completely different. It's not an imperative. That is what we call an indicative statement, which is super nerdy, but let me explain what that means. This indicative statement is not, is not Jesus saying, believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus is saying, you already are believing in God. You already are believing in me. What difference does that make? Who cares about the Greek grammar? Let me explain to you why that is so profound. Let not your hearts be troubled. Why? You're already saved. You're already clean. You're already going to heaven. These disciples are going to have a crazy week seeing Jesus die on the cross, but they're saved. And what do we see in this immediate context? Jesus goes to Peter and says, once I wash your feet, that's all you need. And in the next chapter in John 15, when Jesus is talking to his disciples about abiding in Jesus Christ, he says, you are already clean. I don't need to save you again. And we have this biblical conviction that once you're saved, you're always saved. So yes, it's there. Again, so what is this indicative statement saying? They've already accepted Jesus. And so what is Jesus getting at? Don't let your hearts be troubled. I know you're having a hard time. You're having a hard time receiving this news that I'm about to leave. You're already saved. You're already believing in me. You're already believing in God. So what? In verse 2, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? What is Jesus saying? Church, how do we not let our hearts be troubled? in our moments of brokenness and, and, and heart-aching moments, like what, what do we fix our gaze on? Jesus is saying, heaven, heaven. And when he says, when he's talking about heaven, it's a house. Isn't that interesting? Um, because It's exciting because house makes sense to us. And, and I, I don't know why, but as soon as I'm reading verses 2 to 5, and, and Jesus is talking about this big place, the house of many rooms, right? For some reason, I'm thinking MTV Cribs. That's, that's what I see. So M Jesus is, is inviting us to MTV Cribs. And so as soon as I think MTV Cribs, do you guys know what MTV Cribs is? Okay. Okay. Um, Please say yes, because, yeah. Uh, uh, so MTV Cribs, right, if you don't know, uh, MTV basically invades your house if you're some rich celebrity, and they force you to kind of tour around the house, and they show all your niceties of the house, all your luxuries and fat living, right? And so I think this crazy, crazy house with a lot of rooms. And I don't know when I, th I don't know about you, but when I think of, like, really rich celebrities and people with just excessive money like what kind of houses they live in i don't know why i think of people like bill gates you know bill gates is one of the richest men on the planet right so what kind of house does he have well let me tell you what kind of house that he has because i used to stalk him just kidding google look it up people so bill gates in his house has a fat sound system right 
And you would think Fat Sounds is what does he have, like, like turntables and he like scratches at home, plays hip hop, whatever. No, what I mean is every room in his house has a speaker. Okay, so you think, well, doesn't that just produce loud music? No. So what happens is you program the house so that wherever you go, the music follows you. So if you're in the bathroom, you know, on your throne taking care of business, and the music is playing, it's not playing in other parts of the house. So you get up, you take a shower, it's playing, and it goes all the way to the bottom of the pool. Isn't that crazy? Okay, so, so by the looks of y'all, you're like, I don't care. That doesn't mean anything to me, right? Earphones, look it up, right? So, okay, sound system is not your thing. Anyone here play golf? Some of you play golf. Tiger Woods, you know Tiger Woods has a golf course. I don't mean he owns like La Mirada Golf. He has a golf course at his house. You know, you wake up, you want to play golf. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to reserve a tee time. You don't pay some fee, right? You, you tee up and you shoot. Oh, uh, crazy shot. Let me go again, right? After about 13 mulligans, you're like, oh, I'm finally happy with my shot. No, wait. And then you go. Talk about fat, right? That's crazy. His own golf course. Okay, okay. You're not into the sound system. You're not into golf. Anyone here like traffic? No. Did you know Kobe Bryant, who lives in Newport Beach, goes to work to Staples Center in a helicopter and just beats traffic, right? I mean, talk about, you know, what if I took a helicopter to work, which is here? Oh, my gosh, I'll save three minutes. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's excessive living, right? You're like, okay, I don't need all that. You know what I want personally? If I'm living large, a house with many rooms, okay, I'll be humble. All I want is a basketball gym. That's all I ask. Basketball gym. You know what I'm saying? Do church, come to my house, right? Grill some, grill some steaks, play basketball, right? That's biblical fellowship, right? That's what Christians like to do. I'm all about Jesus, right? So just give me a home gym, right? Or just give me, that's, all, that's all I'm asking. You know what I'm saying? And so when we think of Jesus saying, oh, in my father's house are many rooms, okay, MTV cribs and golf course and all these things. Let's be hermeneutically sound here. Do you think an ancient disciple knows what a basketball court is, knows what a golf course is, knows what amplified music is? No. To an ancient disciple, when Jesus says, in my Father's house are many rooms, in the very last moments of Jesus' earthly life, what do you think Jesus is communicating to his disciples? Maybe our homes will be like that. Maybe they won't. But when we think of the house, heaven, that Jesus is talking about, it's being in the full presence of God. It is being in the full presence of the living God. And so when Jesus puts it like that, I believe, I believe that here and now our souls are longing for something so deep. Our souls are thirsting and hungering to be filled with the presence of the Father. It is not about this fat MTV crib kind of house that we're longing for. We're longing for God and being in his full presence. And we know this because we just keep trying to fill ourselves with the temporaries of this world only to find that they just do not fill. And so as soon as Jesus mentions this idea of a house, we're immediately challenged with something. What do I need to set my heart on? Listen to what Jesus is saying. He's preparing a place for his disciples. And are we letting that weigh on our hearts? You're, replaying a, you're preparing a place for me for what? Okay, heaven. Okay, paradise. Okay, it's going to be good. But what it is, it is really just being in the presence of the Father. And so Thomas is, is kind of thinking about that. He's there and he's listening to Jesus and he's kind of in the same boat as Peter and they're having a hard time saying goodbye and Thomas is more a little bit different like Peter because he's saying, well, just tell me, just tell me what I need to do to get there because I'm not really sensing this geographical location. Text me the address. I can't find it on Google Maps, okay, 777 Heaven Avenue is not showing up on Google. So 
Jesus, tell me how to get there. How can I be in the full presence of the Father to be fully satisfied and just be in awe in the presence of God and be with him in total satisfaction? Do you hear me, church? And then Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. You see, what is Peter's tone and what is Thomas's tone? They've just received news that their beloved rabbi, their master, their caregiver, their counselor, their sole caregiver is now leaving. And why is it that Jesus needs to say, I am the way and the truth and life? Because in our moments of heartbrokenness, in our moments of despair, what do we need, church? You see, we gravitate towards something. Uh, we start having knee-jerk reactions and, and need to hurry up and fill ourselves with something that's going to comfort us. You just had a really bad argument with your parents. You said things that you regret. They have said things that they regret. They have said things to you that were really striking at the heart, hurtful, frustrating. You don't know what to do. A lot of things just happened there. You just kind of unleashed this wrath you didn't know was there. And so now what do you do? You're heartbroken. You're in, bro you're, you're, you're in this dark place of life. Well, okay, call up the homies and grab a few drinks. You grab a drink or two or ten. And now your heart is now gravitating. Well, I need, just need to numb out this pain. You can't give me that. I know what the Bible says. Don't preach at me about drunkenness. You don't know what, what I'm going through now. Let me just have this moment where I can kind of numb out this pain and forget what I'm going through now because that's what's comforting. Right now, that's what, that's what home is. You just broke up with your girlfriend or boyfriend and, and you don't know what the world is throwing at you. You gave your heart and your trust into this person and they have now betrayed you. And so now, and so now what? Escape community, escape church, escape family, escape friends. I just need to be by myself in my own darkness, in my own emoness. Don't talk to me. Don't touch me. Don't do anything. Give me my space. And so what are you gravitating towards? Right? Your heart is now trying to latch on to something. Peter is heartbroken. Thomas is heartbroken. Jesus, how do we find our home? How can we find the place where we are filled and there's going to be no more brokenness, where we can be with you and not be in despair, but be in satisfaction? And verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to me. No one comes to the Father except through me. What we need to hear Okay, what we're doing here is we've just now deconstructed this text, okay? Basically, we've answered the question, how are these disciples receiving this statement of Jesus, okay? And so now if we're going to reconstruct it and allow it to speak to us, now we not need to kind of hear, okay, when Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, how does that speak to us where we are now? You got to listen to me, okay? This is the most exclusive statement of all religion and all philosophy. Um, and what that means for us as Bible believing and Jesus following Christians is that in this culture right now, if we preach this, we stick out like a sore thumb. Okay, we cannot conform to what is going on right now, especially what is hot right now in our culture. It, it, it just doesn't work. What, what is. How does this statement speak to us? This, spe this statement speaks to us uh, both who are people who are religious and not religious, okay? Uh, this speaks to both Christians and non-Christians. This speaks to the LGBTQ community, the anti-LGBTQ community, that's really hard to say, and everyone in between. This speaks to people of all times, all cultures, all ethnicities, and all religions. In our culture right now, what is hot and what is you seeing all over your social network, kind of media and your feeds, like what are you seeing all the time? It's all just about equality. Everything is about equality. Everything, we have made the individual the most radical thing on the planet, right? We abide by radical individualism. You have 
rights that you don't even know. And if any of those rights are violated, you have justification to wreak havoc. That's what we said in our culture. That's what's hot right now, and that's what we celebrate. If I want to be someone else, you can't tell me otherwise. If I was born with male genitalia, but I would now want to be female, well, I can get any kind of procedure I want done. No religion, no, no source, no Bible, no authority can tell me otherwise. If I'm a man, I want to be a woman, well, I'm my own God. I can do that. If I want a man, I want to be a woman, I want to go back to being a man, you can't tell me otherwise. I just heard very recently, this is crazy to me, there is this thing called non-binary, okay? Um, that to me sounds like a computer word, uh, which is really ignorant for me to say, but it's not. It has nothing to do with computers. Non-binary people basically are a category of people who identify themselves as neither male or female. They don't want to be categorized as either. I thought, I th when I first saw that, I thought that was a joke. Is this like an SNL skit? Like, this is crazy. And so I saw this thing on Facebook, because that's the most reliable source for me. Um, on Facebook, I'm seeing this person. I can't say girl guy, right? She man, man she, he, she, whatever this person is. This person says this. People often ask, are you a boy or are you a girl? And this person would say, No. All right? Um, and I'm not trying to ridicule these people. It's just the thought of it is very new to me. And so she says, it's outdated, right? The categorization of male or female, it's outdated. The truth is that gender is in the brain. And physical sex is a completely separate and different thing that every private, that is private to every individual. I'm going to read that again. The truth is that gender is in the brain, and physical sex is a completely separate and different thing that is private to every individual. I don't know if you hear the contradiction in that statement because she uses a word like truth, and then she celebrates the individual. Uh, I don't know if that works, right? And so I don't know if you're hearing that, but basically, what's the idea? You can't tell me who I am. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth of the life. No, you're not. I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus, you are a way, you are a truth, you are a life, or the, the, you are a way to God. How dare you force yourself into my life and tell me who I am and what my identity is? And then what is our response as Christians? It's fear. We see that in this individualistic response, and then we know something is wrong I'm pretty sure Pastor Howard preached on that something a couple months ago. I think I see it in the Bible, but right now, I don't know what, what I need to do, what I need to say. And so what we're looking at here is our human effort to find the truth of anthropology. That's what this is. It is the quest and it is the journey, it is the mission to find who we are. And so when our culture says, I am whoever I want to be, that's my right, what does Jesus say? It's a big fat no. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this isn't just Jesus versus culture. You've got to understand, this also speaks to the church and religion as well. I think some of us kind of like this uh, open-mindedness. Like if you're really kind of digesting this statement of Jesus, and, and some of you, your natural temperament is, well, I, I like open-mindedness. Um, I, I don't like exclusion. I hear you, Pastor Howard, when you're saying that Jesus is making a very exclusive statement. So, so what you're telling me then is we have to discount every other religion, every other philosophy? Are you telling me then that the vast majority of the world is actually going to face hell? Is that what you're telling me? You see, some of us have a hard time dealing with that. And so we like kind of this, this well-roundedness of religion where I have the freedom. Well, okay, I go to live stream. I hear what Pastor Howard is preaching. Okay, but why can't I check out a Buddhist temple and see what their worship is like? They seem to be teaching this message about love. Why can't I go to a Mormon service 
or a Catholic service or, or, or an Islamic service and see and check out what they're preaching on because it kind of just seems like everyone is preaching this message of love. And so how can you say that this is the only way? You see, here's a difference, church. You don't need to go to every kind of religious celebration and service to get a feel for what it is because every other religion will point you to the same truth, works-based religion. Every other religion is based on this premise that we call moralistic deism. I know that's a fancy word, but broken down, it's really simple. Moralistic, what does that mean? What is right and what is wrong? That there is a standard. That there is something out there, a source says that there is good and there is bad, there is right and there is wrong. Moralistic. Deism, what is that? The belief in a God. And so what does moralistic deism say? There is a God out there who is standing at you with his arm crossed as a judge, waiting for you to get your act together and perform a righteous lifestyle so you can earn your salvation. You want to talk about who God is? Okay, that's a different conversation. But right now what we're dealing with is every other religion says you need to find your own way to the religion. Do you hear that? And so what is the John 14.6 of Mormonism? What is John 14.6 of Catholicism? Of the Islamic religion, of the Buddhist religion, you are the way. You are the, you are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. Jesus' statement here is just the most radical, exclusive statement that we can ever see. And so I know I just talked about a lot of things, and so let me just leave you with just something a little bit more concrete to think about. I think this passage should impact us in a couple ways. Uh, First, it brings to us comfort when things in this world fail us. And so when you just kind of think about what in this world fails you, uh, you're going to come to the sobering reality that everything fails you. Everything is going to fail you. People, programs, communities, churches, everything at some point in time is going to fail you. And, and so you look at, at the context of this and you see Peter and Thomas in their very dark moment of heartbrokenness, in their remorse and in their despair. And Jesus is saying, do not let your hearts be troubled. I am the way and the truth and the life. And so as covenant community members, as people who are confident in our salvation, we can look to Jesus for comfort. It speaks to our hearts. Second, it should cause us to make a stand in this world for truth. If we really take John 14, 6 seriously, it's going to bleed out in the way we think, in the way we talk, in the way we act and behave. For those of you who are really just kind of hoping that you've accepted Christ and you're just kind of hoping to kind of cruise through the Christian life and kind of dodge all the bullets, Matrix style, and and just kind of hope that all this political drama and radical individualism doesn't come your way, you start dodging it, I got news for you. If you take this seriously, God is calling you to make a stand for truth. If you're a follower of Jesus, you will preach Jesus. And I'm not saying going out on the corner and hold up a sign that says Jesus or hell because I've seen stuff like that. That's not what I'm saying. Um, But in your workplaces and in your schools and in your families, there needs to be an engagement with people where you can speak truth in a loving way. That when you say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, you're not preaching brimstone and fire. You're not saying, oh, you're going to go to hell. Hell is definitely part of the picture. Don't get me wrong. But when you look at John 14, 6, in the context of what Jesus is saying, what is it about? It's about, man, we're going home. Doesn't your heart long to be home? And you're speaking to the non-Christian and you're, and you're asking them point blank, listen, listen, is anything in this world going to really satisfy you? I mean, okay, accepting Christ is about escaping hell, but let's get fear, let's get hell out of the picture. Are you really going to be happy in this life or the next? And now you have to confront them with the real decision, who is this Jesus guy? When he says, 
this exclusive statement, I am the way and the truth and the life. You see, when you present it that way, yes, there's this exclusivity, but when you speak to that truth in humility, what you are doing is you are now making this exclusivity the most inclusive thing anyone can ever hear. Why? Because it's not about you. And, and as soon as you think that you can earn your salvation and, and you need to earn your way, your truth, and your life, there's this incredible amount of pressure and condemnation that produces in you. And so now it's moralism and moralism, moralism, and you can't fix it. But when you look at Jesus, man, oh man, he took the work, he did the work, and he completed it. We can find rest. We're going to go home, brothers and sisters. One day we will go home, a house of many rooms with a golf course. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, but it's going to be good, okay? It's going to be good. I hope that speaks to you, church. Join me in prayer.